Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Today, um, we will be joined by Daphne Robert Hamilton. Uh, we're going to be talking about resource guarding. Uh, she's waiting in the lobby. We just had some good conversations. She has some references for you and some books she's going to uh, recommend. Um, we're going to be talking about, well, before I get into resource guarding, um, I'm going to wait and bring Daphne on for that. Um, for those of you that are new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world through our live streaming services how to work with, an, work with animals, empower them, and empower our relationship with them no matter what the species. And we do that um, with our approaches in applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement. So good morning, Deb, Bobby, Joanne, Chris, Katie, Chris, another Chris, Lee, Tim. Hey, everybody, Amy, Eva. Um, good morning, Sean and Dee Dee. Yeah, so um, resource guarding is something we've been talking about in our memberships, primarily our level two membership. Um, and it's very common and it's across species, including the human. Um, but yeah, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. First of all, happy holidays, Merry Christmas. A week ago, it wasn't even Christmas yet. Now we're getting ready to enter the new year. Um, and with that being said, oh, um, we decided, I know this is somewhat local, but we're all go also going to be live, live streaming this today. Um, as soon as I get done with this coffee with the critters. <laughs> <laughs> at one o'clock this afternoon where we've decided to have a holiday open house where we open our doors to the public and we rarely do this. Maybe if we're lucky, we do it once a year. Um, the animal behavior center, like I said, is an international educational center. Um, we live stream on purpose because inside these doors can be a very dangerous place to be. Um, that's why our doors are always locked and the alarms are always on. Um, we work with and we show people how to work with behavior and understand behavior through working with animals. Um, so our open house will be today. And I intentionally did not send out an email about it because I don't <laughs> have a feeling we're going to get overloaded. So right after this live stream, I'm going out um, getting animals situated. We're getting tables situated and we're going to open our doors for the first time this year. 2018 and we will not open them again until next year which is two days away <laughs> uh, but we won't likely have this again until this time next year so what we're going to do hey Shelly Shelly's driving here from quite a distance she'll be here good morning everybody um, we're gonna try to live stream this this afternoon here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page um, so with that being said um, the new year is in what two days uh, less than now um, for those of you that are interested, we have our, pro our um, online learning where we teach people through our memberships and our projects. Our level one membership is primarily for people living everyday life with companion animals. Level two is um, a little more intense where people get weekly content, um, weekly live streams. Uh, I live stream with a numerous, numerous different species of animals and we have uh, Q and A's in both the memberships um, and in level two, we're going to be bringing on um, speakers in their area of profession. Anyways, we have the Parrot Project, which is extremely popular and skyrocketing and doing fabulous. We had a great holiday season. We brought a bunch of people on live talking about the work they do. You can find out more about that on our website and you can find that right here at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. If you ever need to reach me, I answer each and every email, and you can get a hold of me at Laura, L A R A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. So, do I have anything else to say before we get started? No, I don't. Let me take, the, take this agenda off of here, and I'm going to bring in Daphne Robert Hamilton. Daphne, you ready? Coming in in three, three seconds, less than. Yay, there she is. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. <laughs> um, so this is Daphne Robert Hamilton. Um, Daphne, if you guys watch 
or frequent viewers of um, Coffee with the Critters, Daphne's usually, you attend almost every every Sunday morning. Pretty much. <laughs> so I wanted to, because I, I watch some of the work you do. I belong to your of one of your groups. Um, so I see a lot of the stuff you post. Um, Daphne is a professional dog trainer and offers services, coaching people and training dogs. Daphne is also available for private lecture, lessons, lecture, lectures and webinars. There so we um, what's that? I said, there we go. <laughs> I was telling Daphne in the um, test right before this, I'm like, I still always get nervous every morning before coffee with the critters. And in March, we'll be doing this every Sunday morning for four years. <laughs> so um, Daphne, nice to finally meet you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say about yourself before we get started on this controversial topic, misunderstood topic, very prevalent topic? Uh I, the only thing that pops into mind is that when you're working with a particular species, like me and dogs, it helps to work with different animals. So I used to be a horse trainer prior to being a dog trainer. Uh, I transitioned into that. And then obviously I'm a big bird fanatic, Rico and Rocky. <laughs> uh, so, and I actually went to Peru and studied Andean hummingbirds and just watching their mannerisms and stuff. So. Working with different animals definitely helps you fine tune your observation without putting labels on behavior right away. So I'm that's the thing. So that glad you said it. that. I love that. Um, and that's why we do the work that we do here, multiple species. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say before, um, I have so many friends in the professional dog training world, you, one of them, that do such great work. I love the fact that you said you worked with horses. There's so many people that work with horses that transition to dogs or work with dogs and transition to horses. Um, but we can learn so much through working with different species. Get it, get to know the behavior in its context rather than labeling behavior. Definitely. Rather than labeling, labeling what? Behavior. Okay, good. I like that. Um, because especially, well, not especially, um, with any behavior, once you label it, um, you know, the dog is aggressive, the bird is, uh, what hormonal, when you label that, it tends to stick behavior in a bowl where it just circles and circles and the, the actual behavior isn't dealt with because people think, oh, that's just how it is. Yep. That's the way we get, and especially in the bird world, a lot of people are like, you have a bird, you're just going to get bit. That biting means something. I don't want to get bit. Um, so, yeah, and Margaret just posted here, and how true that is, hummingbird, there's a classic, classic resource garter right there. Isn't that well, the that, truth? There are actually two types of hummingbirds. There are some that are trap liners, and there are some that are territorial. So those that are territorial actually protect certain uh, food resources where trap liners actually travel from ter territory to territory, taking advantage of anything they find. So you have two types. Very interesting. <laughs> You're a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> so let's talk about um, resource guarding. Do you wanna get started or let's um, say what first, let's define what it is. Um, because wow. just in our level two membership, we talked yeah. about, we just recently talked about this pretty intently and several members said, I had no idea that's what I was seeing. All right. I can go deep. All right. Resource guarding. What is it? It is a natural behavior. All species on this planet have it, including human kids. I see it a lot in children. And if you've had children, you understand that when they're about two and a half, three till about, well, and some people it goes into adulthood. Uh, where they have issues sharing. So again, it's a very natural behavior and it doesn't always express. It depends on what's going on in the environment. It has to deal with other individuals and it has to deal with the values. So there's a lot of variables that come into play uh, to express that behavior. So sometimes you have to have the perfect storm to uh, actually push that button on for that resource guarding to come. Uh, it is based a little bit in an anxiety-based behavior, 
and the gist of it is deep down DNA genetics, it's a selfish gene. It's about obtaining resources for survival so that you can basically reproduce and pass on your genes. And that protect them from. Yeah. And speaking of selfish, we're all selfish um, to some I'm extent. Happy, so. <laughs> So um, resource guarding, and I often explain it to people, is when um, animals, human animals included, protect things of high value. We all do. If we didn't, what's that? High value to the individual. I know some dogs that will protect a cat whisker on the carpet. That will protect a what? Cat whisker. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And this can be um, resource guarding can be um, in this in level two. Somebody just mentioned yesterday. I thought it was just with food, yeah. but um, we can resource ourselves and animals can resource guard food, toys, um, people, other animals. Mm -hmm. And um, we have it here in every animal, and I see it um, like with Quincy, our Rottweiler, and Milo, um, the pig. They will resource guard areas, areas yeah. that bring. Um, and there's a story, Area, one, but I'll tell you. Areas that are predictive of value. Um, so they can also start uh, time of day. So if you're getting ready to prepare, and I know that you kind of you're not, and I like this that you're not rigid on a feeding schedule. You kind of mix it up a little bit, but some dogs are, they're on the clock. They're like, oh, it's getting ready for feeding time. I'm gonna start guarding because I know what my human's getting ready to do, especially when you live in a house with multiple dogs. So the time, uh, the environment itself becomes valuable. So I did a training session with my male Doberman and I was doing some maybe 15 minutes with him and my female was somewhere else. When we were done, my female walked into the room and he immediately attacked her. He was resource guarding the event. We just finished a training session that was, he was amped up. He was a little, you know, guarding that environment. So when she walked in, that was it. Yeah. Um, we have issues here, all three of our dogs. Um, all of our parrots, the turkey vulture, cello, the roller pigeon, Milo, the pig, our, I see it in our fish, um, will resource guard. Um, so um, something you just mentioned, oh, snow. This is what was happening here. It took me a little bit to identify exactly what was happening. Um, the problem arose before I, before I could identify what was causing it. Um, before I knew it was happening. And it was between Quincy, our Rottweiler, and Snow, our deaf and blind border collie. Um, Snow gets fed in the kitchen. Quincy and Levi get fed in the dining room. Um, and there is no really particular time, but what is predictable about it is um, all the cues that are set up before that, set up, such as setting out the dishes side by side, Yep. Um, opening the fridge, cracking an egg, getting ready, getting the food ready to go in. Um, and what Quincy was doing is it looks like she's just laying at the gate. You know what I mean? What it caused Snow to do over time, what I started realizing, Snow would walk over to the gate. She could tell Quincy was there and she would start spinning and barking. Um, so... And then what it what it started doing is Snow stopped eating her food. She would not eat. And there was a couple of days she went without eating. And so what I did instead was using environmental events to change behavior. This is the key in teaching a station, telling an animal where to go and stay there or asking them where to go and stay there until requested to do otherwise. I asked Quincy to station on her bed, which is on the other side of the dining room, and then um, just trained her to wait until her food dish is served, which is far from the gate. Um, Snow started eating again. Yes. And so that has to go with social mapping. So when you live with uh, a bunch of dogs, they have their own communication of what's comfortable with them and what's not comfortable. So they do a social mapping. So when you start getting some tension in the air or stress, 
the other animal can behave a certain way, which causes the other animals going, oh, they're communicating loud and clear that they're starting to resource guard. Humans might not pick it up. They might see it as completely normal behavior. But if the other animals start behaving differently, like avoiding, spinning, showing some stress signals, it's like, oh, that's because the shark is in the water and you have chum in the water. There's a oh, reason that analogy. it doesn't happen in a void. There's always a causation. There's always antecedents that cause that behavior to express. So if your other animals are starting to show some avoidance or stress behaviors, probably one of your animals is starting to display some signals of, this is my event. This is mine, 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 mine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. We were just talking about this yesterday in level two about resource guarding between a dog, um, res a dog resource guarding um, a person. Um, and when the person is getting, when the person cues that they're getting ready to go work with other animals. Um, very interesting. So, so, have on that. so <clears throat> some people, and again, a lot of times humans, we either start a behavior problem or we enable it or exacerbate it. So my aunt actually had a Westie and the Westie was quite bonded to my aunt, came to a point where my uncle could not enter the room if my aunt was in the room. The dog would resource guard my aunt. They couldn't hug each other anymore. The dog would go and aggress. So you gotta be careful what you find cute. Yeah, so exactly. And you can actually, unknowingly reinforce the undesired behavior, which then punishes the behavior of the husband and wife touching or hugging or kissing in front of the dog. Yeah. Why not just work with the behavior? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Deb Jones is on. She just says, hi, Daphne. Hey, Deb. I guess I'm chum. What about me? Oh, she did say hi, Laura, too. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, in resource guarding is misunderstood. A lot of people don't recognize what it looks like um, and don't take action until the behavior is a serious problem. I guess the key is being able to identify what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we have resource guarders here. You want to talk about resource guarding uh, with when you have parrots that are bonded working with a bonded pair of parrots. They will resource guard each other. Um, we've had situations here where you cannot get into an enclosure because the bird won't allow you. It'll fly after you, whatever. All those signs and signals are there, and we are getting ready to talk about this in the parrot project. How do you work with a bonded pair? I work with bonded pairs all the time. What I try to do, um, targeting, stationing, a lot of different things. It all depends on that individual pair. Um, but I just try to come in as a threesome. And I mean, it can be just as much as you have a parrot here, you have a parrot here, you try to walk in between, boom, you're gonna get attacked, well, lunged at bit by both. Um, so I will shape that behavior. I will start working on it and it's usually a station. Allow me in to this relationship. We have to, and that's so common with parrots. You're working with uh, a social species and they're um, in the companion parrot world, they're separated, they're caged individually. Um, whereas in the wild, you would see them flocking, um, a lot of species, not all, you'll see them flocking by the amount of 30, 100, 500, okay? Now we're keeping them housed individually. It's a, that's a big concern and in, in behavior issue in the companion parrot world. But you can work with it. Yes, you can. You have to be crafty. You definitely have to work with somebody that uh, can think outside of the box and that can observe behavior. And it's about, again, what would you want your animal to do? So uh, some dogs live by themselves. So some families only have one dog and not multiple. And sometimes the dog will start showing aggression around feeding time or if you approach the food bowl. Uh, an old technique was, well, show them who's boss, put your hand in the food, mix it up, pet the dog. I said, you know, that can go either way. Most often than not, it just further ticks off the dog. It reinforces <laughs> it just, the behavior you're trying to change. Yeah. So 
a new way is, okay, what would I rather the dog do? Well, maybe if I approach and the dog either backs up or sits down or lifts his head, then I could reward that with something more interesting than what's in the food bowl. So that you start really, you know, having power of the punch with maybe, I don't know, peanut butter and jam, you know, a little treat when you approach and they're going to start associating, oh, okay, her approach is not threatening anymore. You know, she predicts better things and she's not messing with me and she's not messing with my food. So all is good. So, again, there's still old notions out there of what you should do and how you should treat resource guarding. You know, one is, you know, let them know who's boss, mess with them, mess with the food, take the food away, give the food back. Um, if they have an item like a rawhide and they start showing mild signs of possession and First possession is point of contact, so they'll either put their paws on top of it or their chin. And if they start guarding something, immediately you're supposed to show them who's boss and take the item away and That's say so you know, and punish the the signaling. Uh, Patricia McConnell, I went to a conference years and years ago, and she talked about a story of this cute little golden retriever puppy who was guarding a uh, uh, rawhide, and she didn't know what to do. Puppy was quite small. She spoke to her veterinarian. Veterinarian gave her some advice, and the advice was, well, make sure you are the boss. Make sure you're alpha. So if, they, if the dog growls or possesses anything, you immediately take it away. Uh, pin them to the ground, right? Well, the dog was getting bigger, six months old, now 80 pounds, and the whole behavior spiraled. Didn't end well for the dog. Oh, I can Not imagine. the owner's fault. The owner was simply doing what was she what she was told to do. But you got to be very careful with your approach on how you're trying to solve problems. <laughs> I usually say, "Well, Doctor Phil, how's that working for you?" <laughs> so, um, if you're not seeing an improvement in behavior, then you're approaching your method. You got to scrap it. Yeah. And one thing to keep in mind here, if your whatever your approach is um, and you see the behavior maintaining or increasing, you may want to second guess your approach. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know there's a lot of old fallacies people um, do, like you said, be the dominant, be the alpha. When you're working with a resource guarder, that can be very dangerous mm -hmm. um, uh, because a lot of times you're going to reinforce the very behavior. You may see the behavior go away temporarily or be extinguished temporarily. Right. And then yeah. the animal doesn't take it anymore and boom, then you've got it big time. And all that takes is one time mm -hmm. and it can be very dangerous for the animal and it can be very dangerous for that little kid walking by. I'm going to go back because I just popped in my head about what, do animals guard and find valuable? It changes by individual and it can be one or two predictable things or it could be a plethora of things. So I mentioned that I knew one dog that used to guard any cat whiskers that was uh, left on the carpet. Uh, some dogs will guard uh, bunny balls, any fluffs of fur left on the ground. My boy, my male Doberman, I mean, we had a bunch of toys in the house, but if I brought in a new toy in the house, that was to be guarded. Uh, empty food bowls, vomit. It could pretty much be anything. Mm -hmm. Just don't keep limited thought to toys and, and food or food bowl. It could be water. It could be vomit. It could be a sock. It could be anything. It's not what you, what the human sees as, oh, that must be valuable to them. Yes. The animal says, this is mine. Yes. We have an animal here in particular. Um, definitely. I mean, it's something we always have to be aware of, but these, some of the, the cues as to, is this really what I'm seeing is um, real fast jerky movement. When it sees something of value come in, um, I see him tense up. And then as soon as you deliver it to him, he's like, bam, um, takes it very quickly. Um, he also resource guards other animals and food. Um, you'll see here um, animals will resource guard areas. 
the, and, and with resource guarding here at the center, it, I mean, you have to have it under control or it could be a very dangerous outcome for so many of the animals that we have here. That goes back um, to social mapping. Um, one thing that comes into play with families with multiple dogs, I just had one recently, uh, young, younger dog, very predictive in guarding food related items. And then they had an older dog that had vision impairment. So the older dog had a hard time navigating the social mapping, one, because he can tell if there was chum in the water, and two, he wasn't able to quite read her body language well. So then you're on high management at that point. Uh, but yeah, when you have an impaired animal in an environment with a, what I call them sharks, you gotta be a little more heavy on the management aspect. That's snow. Yeah. That, that snow with our other two dogs and that snow with the pig, that snow with the parrots. Yeah. Um, and having, that, that can lead to quality of life issues because that older dog now is walking on eggshells because he's not, he can't read the environment and he's on shore, which is causing him stress and anxiety. So now it's all on high management, putting the other dog away so that he can have a little more freedom and less tension. And you can manage this. You can manage this. We do it here all the time. Yes. Um, I know, uh, let's see, Sylvia had a comment here. Um, Sylvia is a professional dog trainer just over the border in Canada. Um, many are changing their approach as they are realizing resource guarding is high in the shelter setting. Um, Let's see, sorry, I'm trying to get this comment off and I can't find it to turn it off. Again, it takes a, you know, you gotta have the perfect mix. Sometimes resource guarding doesn't express. Yeah. So sometimes in a shelter setting, you know, there's the, well, it depends what kind of assessment you do, but there's either uh, invasion of the animal. So you're doing a lot of petting or testing the feet or you're doing a rawhide test or a food guarding test, it might not express, but when you place that dog in a foster home, then it starts expressing. So, you know, it's a, it's a hit and miss. And it's, so it's key to, to know what you're looking at or understand. And if you don't understand, reach out to somebody that can help you before this turns into a major issue with a long history of reinforcement um, and somebody or something gets hurt. Here's another um, thing that I get to too. So a single family that has one dog, everything's happy, hunky-dory, no issues. Friends come over, friends bring their dog, and then there's mayhem. So when you start bringing another dog into the environment, then the dog that's living there starts resource guarding because there's competition. And now there's like, oh. So resource guarding with dogs can either express with humans directly or not. Or if you have other animals in the environment, it'll express. So again, there's a lot of variables that come into play to have that behavior come out. Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to talk about with you saying this. And one is I have written down Levi. Um, if you don't know what you're looking at, and a lot of people don't. And I'll and when it starts happening here, I'm like, look what's going on, guys. Um, and that is when Levi, we've got volunteers in and out of here. All of the dogs here love interacting with the volunteers. Um, Levi knows there's a volunteer in a different room and you let two dogs in, he's gonna run up, greet the person, Snow will be coming right behind or Quincy and he will put himself between the person and the other dog. And if you watch closely, that, bot, that behavior is there, you'll see these are the antecedents to look for. Here's the person. Um, here's the approaching dog. Levi's in between. You'll see him wiggle wag, and then he turns and looks behind him. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and then something else we didn't discuss, uh, some of the behavior could be just freezing. You know, um, if I see an animal freeze, I'm like, whoa, what's happening here? And some um, are very quick and very subtle signals, right? Yep. Uh, and it depends if the other individuals can read that or not. So resource guarding is not necessarily something you have to address or fix. If the other individuals in the environment are reading and learning from each other of, okay, he needs to be left alone. I'm just going to go over here and do my own thing. So if the animals in the environment are learning 
their social dance and learning how to diffuse things, do you really need to address it and fix it? It's when individuals aren't reading each other and things can start escalating or going the wrong path that you need to intervene and kind of help direct the animals to safer outcomes. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lily, who is a follower, just mentioned something. Wouldn't you just put put the dog away that is acting up? Not necessarily. What in, in Lily? It's a great question. It's a common question that a lot of people would ask. Um, but it, my concern with that would be it's not it's not letting the dog know what to do instead. Exactly. It's a. It's just a measure after the fact. So then for me, that's just a signal of, oh, OK, now I have to think. And how can I better help this animal cope? So then you go into the training part is, OK, so I need to do more impulse control games with the dog. I need to do more stationing with this dog. And I need to do new. Um, sometimes I do group activities, especially with dogs that do what Quincy does, which is you can't get attention now. This is my human. Everybody else stay back. Uh, so I do. Uh, pair training, which is the one that is jealous of the other animals getting attention is, okay, you're on station and I'm going to pay a little attention to this animal, but I'm truly training the animal that's on station. Sure. But thank you for showing a little patience and a little control. Good job. So that's the things that you need to teach so that when, again, so if they're expressing uh, a little tension or a little possession issues, it's just information of, oh, okay, I got some work to do with that animal. Yeah. Or especially in this context. Yeah. Um, something, and we do a lot of that here with our focus and control exercises. We're always doing focus and control exercises, and it can be something so subtle as if we're working with dogs, sit, stay, you come, sit, stay, now you come. Um, stop when I ask you to. We do a lot of those things here. Um, you've seen in our, I need to stop calling it to the, bur the bird room because there's so many other things in there. Um, we have a square that it's, it's just duct tape that's taped to the floor in a square and it fits Milo's, the pig's body perfectly. Um, we, you have a dog in a pig coming in or a couple of dogs in a pig coming in um, together. That can be a very dangerous situation. Um, so the dogs were always practicing for uh, an accident. That's why we keep when every time I let Milo into the animal room, the first thing I'll ask him is go to your station. He knows all four feet on those, on that tape square, I can control the environment. Um, we do a lot of shifting and moving of different animals. Some of those are protected, some it's some it's not protected with, with a barrier. That's why we have the X's on the floor um, by each one of the bird cages. Uh, I will ask Quincy and Levi to go station on the, the X's at the farthest back. Um, I'll let Milo out of his enclosure. I ask him to go to his station. So there's no barrier, but there's distance. I ask him to go to his station. I keep that station on a continuous schedule of reinforcement because I need it to always happen and remain extremely strong. So he goes to his station. He knows things of high value are delivered at the station. The dogs are far enough away, but the dogs are watching Milo receive goodies. Um, this is something, this is a scenario I had to shape. Um, and then Milo knows after he goes to his station, door opens, go out. Um, he earns reinforcement out there. Dogs, you know, the cue could be for them to release off their station is when the door shuts. No, I need you to stay there because I may be shifting and moving something else. Um, Levi's deaf, Quincy isn't, and I take turns. I'll be like, Quincy, stay. Levi, come give the cues. Um, and then I keep Quincy back there, but I make it worth her while for staying back there. Mm -hmm. She's a resource guarder of me. So it may not be treats that I give her. Um, I could be giving her attention, making sure that when I'm delivering the reinforcers for to both animals that I'm not actually reinforcing, um, resource guarding that's going to happen there. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. So and, 
that, that popped into my mind because when you're starting to look at behavior, sometimes what we see might not exactly be the expression of behavior. So for example, with separation anxiety, people say, well, they chewed up my carpet, they chewed up my couch, they, they did something to my bed. And I go, well, that's not necessarily separation anxiety, it could be something else. So with resource guarding, when people say, oh, he's always protecting his bed, you know, if you're approaching, especially with dogs that are resting, that cannot, it's not always just resource guarding, it could be other things. So uh, my recent boy, Gunner, uh, he had a, an issue from birth of space invasion. He was extremely sensitive to his surrounding space. And that ebbed and flowed depending on the time of day or how he was feeling. But he was very, very sensitive to if you walked in his direction, he would immediately aggress. So growl, snap. When he was a puppy, he'd actually bite and make contact. But as he got older, and the more that I understood what his sensitivity was, uh, he was extremely sensitive to his personal space. So if you're walking his direction, when you were about three feet away, it's like, Gunner, I'm coming, get up and move. And then that would diffuse the whole situation. But if you continued walking his way, he would, you could predict that he would grump. Um, so some animals are super sensitive to their personal space and that's okay. You just have to learn what their sensitivity is. Sure. And some of that sensitive space here is when a dog is in a crate, mm. um, which brings to, I mean, if any parrot people are on here watching, how do we keep our birds in cages? You know, uh, these are prey animal, but anyways, that's going into another direction. Um, Catherine Schmidt said something. Uh, I think I recognize her name. I think she might be a newer follower. Alternative behavior is so important not to let them alone in a behavior vacuum. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm always asking people, what do you want the animal to do instead? What do you want them to do instead? Um, somebody on here asked um, somebody in the membership. I can't remember where it's at without going too far back. Um, Forgot the question already. Oh, when do you start working with this behavior? I know something I would say is, do you understand what you're looking at? Really watch behavior. No matter what is coming out of your mouth, and I just did a sample with this yesterday, no matter what is coming out of your mouth, um, I know a lot of people like to sit there and talk and talk and talk. Does the animal really understand? what you're saying. They're primarily reading your behavior. And I did this yesterday with, doesn't matter the animal, but it was one of my birds. Um, he was on my, I was target training him. He was on my arm, on my fist, and I was asking him for a kiss. And I say, so you may think it's what's coming out of your mouth that they're paying attention to. So I said, kiss. But at the same time, I'm turning and the proximity is getting closer. That's a lot of what he's reading. And he reaches out and kisses and he knows every time he kisses, he gets a pine nut. So I turned to him and said a word he's never heard before. I said, peso. And he reached and kissed. So that was just, you know, I was doing this. It was just me and two of my birds out there. But I was just like, that's just showing he has no idea what's coming out of my mouth. He's reading my behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, another area where oh, a lot of people bring animals into their homes and then try to tra change natural behavior or get upset because of natural behavior that the animal is showing. You bring a pig into the house, you have a pig. You bring two pigs into the house, you have two pigs. You have two resource guarders, <laughs> major resource guarders. Um, some resource guarding that I behavior issues that I see very commonly in different species are things like turkey vultures and pigs. When I have, when I'm working with numerous pigs, um, I always say it's like a feeding frenzy of sharks. Swear, you know, you'll see them, I mean, feeding numerous pigs at once without training them can be a very scary situation. I would be standing on somebody's counter instead of on the ground <laughs> if there was no training going on. Yeah, and again, especially with the dogs, and 
again, there's so many variables, but if the other individuals with dogs are able to, again, have that social map and understand that, oh, he has his special thing, I'm just gonna avoid it and diffuse the whole thing. So for example, my last two dogs, my two Ridgebacks, my female was a resource garter. You give her a rawhide or a special treat and you could tell that was pretty intense for her. But the way that she resolved it is that we have a freestanding fireplace. So she would go on the other side of the fireplace and then my boy would be on the other side of the fireplace. So they put a physical barrier between each other so they resolve their own thing to have their special little treat. So some dogs will do that. So again, when should you start addressing an issue is when you start seeing that the other individuals aren't able to read or diffuse a situation and that it's not dangerous because it is a natural behavior. I think we got to be careful with um, when you give a person a hammer, everything becomes a nail. So when it comes to behavior, you have to look at the whole situation, the whole environment. Are people and animals safe? How intense is this behavior? Is it predictive? Can we manage the variables? So you have to have a really big look and saying, okay, maybe we just, you know, tweak a few things to diffuse the situation, or maybe sometimes it's like, oh yeah, we really need to do a lot more impulse control and stationing work with this animal and introduce as, that as a daily activity. And not just focus on the animal that expresses resource guarding, but you gotta work with the other animals as well to teach them behaviors on how to be safe in that context. So you can't just focus on that individual. Again, if you live with multiple animals, it's like you gotta do training with the other ones as well to teach them how to avoid that particular animal in a certain context. Sure, working with numerous animals um, and people, not just the resource garter, but the other ones that have a, a part in this equation, it can be very stressful, a very stressful living situation. And you're yeah. likely to see other behaviors starting to problem behaviors, behavior concerns, behavior issues start to arise out of it. That can impact quality of life. So one example of teaching a dog, especially if you give them a special treat or a cookie, if you know if they're highly uh, sensitized to when you give them a treat and they go into kind of protection possession mode is to teach them, okay, when I give you something special, I need you to run to your crate. I need you to run at the top of the stairs at the landing. I need you to go station somewhere safe and I'll teach the other animals how to stay in another part of the house and everybody's happy hunky-dory but I would train that behavior really strong and create a default behavior is that when I give you something special, you go that way. So kind of the same thing that you're doing with the pigs and, and your square target in the, in the yeah. area, so yeah. And I like that what you just said, keeping the behavior of um, asking an animal to go to a station, <laughs> keeping that behavior very strong. Mm -hmm. Ask them to do it when there's no resource guarding situation. Exactly. exactly. This should be a daily routine activity because you want to keep that battery charge of this is the default behavior I want because I'm going to need it when you start having those expressions of this is mine. I need that behavior there for that particular situation. Yeah. So, for example, you come home and you walk in the door and all three dogs are like, oh, I'm so excited. Go to your station. Mm -hmm go to your station and yeah. then deliver attention after they, um, after a period of time on the station. Yep. Um, but um, yeah, so there was, uh, let's see, we got about 15 minutes left. Um, there was a story I wanted to tell. Is there anything, a story you want to tell or I'll t me tell this story and it might spark an idea. Yep. Go ahead. This was one of my favorite stories ever. Um, so I do a lot of work with different zoos. Um, this one particular zoo asked me to work with a macaque who I had already identified <laughs> was, had a very long history of resource guarding being reinforced um, and no alternative behaviors were trained. I was scared to death of this animal. I didn't want anything to do with this animal. Um, and I didn't understand working with the species. 
So I was just like, all right, challenge accepted. Let's learn this, you know, um, and this happens to be um, a, re a, a macaque. And I have a whole webinar I give on resource guarding and he was a part of it. Uh, Deb Jones is in here. She saw me work with this macaque. Um, I didn't want to work with him. Um, I was very afraid of him. So I started learning his behavior through teaching a station, teaching a nose target, teaching, then it moved to teaching a foot target, getting, asking him to move to different areas. Um, I worked with him with the very long stick in case I misread um, some behavior. Um, and I did a few times, <clears throat> but um, I learned from my mistakes and he ended up um, aggressing on the target stick and the key is at least it wasn't my hands, wasn't my fingers, uh, wasn't me. But what I did is when I saw that he aggressed on it, I was just like, and I recorded a lot of my work and I would go home and sit there and rewatch it. And then I could see those antecedents that I missed. I was just like, there it was. Pay attention to the eyebrows. Um, so I just make sure I don't do it again. And if I do it again, I'm like seriously taking a step back because if it happens twice, three times, now that undesired behavior is being reinforced. Um, so I ended up building, after a couple of months of working with him, I ended up building this really strong relationship with him. I respected him um, and respected the fact that he's in an enclosure. He doesn't have, his choices are limited. Um, but then after a year of training, um, not even after a year of training, what I saw was um, a group of people were coming through while I was sitting there working with him. And one of the keepers came up to me and I was still probably, I was probably about four feet from his enclosure. Now this was an animal that when I first started working with him, he would lunge at me, he would grab at me, he would show me his teeth. Um, so then I began understanding him through training. He began understanding my intentions through training. I don't mind being trained by an animal <clears throat> as long as we're both getting along. Um, what I saw was I ended up taking a break from training and moved about four feet from his enclosure. A keeper came up to talk to me and she was introducing me to somebody and she came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder like this. And as soon as she did, he was like, Ugh! you know, um, reaching trying to reach through the cage bar so now i looked at him and i was just like is are you resource guarding me and i looked at the girl and i said not sure what i just saw but would you tap me on the shoulder again and she did and he did it again and he became very uh, upset stressed um through different signs he was showing me and so i was just like okay don't touch me again i got some things to work on here <laughs> before I reinforce any further that undesired behavior. So it's all about balance. Once I saw that I started becoming of high value um, and it wasn't just through food. Deb saw me do this work with him. And I have this on, um, on video where I would walk up. Um, he's a resource guarder of anything in his cage. I don't care if a stick falls in, a tissue falls in, it is now his. Um, I would walk up and take a stick as far away from the enclosure as I could without getting any undesired behavior, such as the boo -boo. Um, And I would hand it to him. And then I trained him, I hand it to you, you hand it back to me. So what he was taking it in his possession and then handing it back to me. Did I make mistakes? I made a couple. They were, I mean, I saw behavior I did not want to see again. So I would rewatch my video to make sure. Um, and then what I started teaching him was to clean his cage. Uh, clean your enclosure. Go get that stick. Give it to me. Go get that uh, food dish. Give it to me. And I always, and it was such a great conversation between the two of us. So then I became something highly valued. So I was just like, this is where it's all about balance. I need to get another, I need to get a keeper in here. 
you need to do this and then you need to do this. So it doesn't just focus on me, focus on you. Once Micaiah starts doing this to, for you, then I'm coming back into the equation to make sure we have that balance. Then we add a third, then we add a fourth. That was my story. <laughs> That's all. Awesome. That actually did trigger a story. And I think Liz might be watching this morning. So Liz is a friend and a very old past client. She had a Doberman that used to, there she is. Hey Liz, good morning. Um, she had a Doberman that would have some possession aggression issues uh, or resource guarding with uh, a ball, I think it was. So what we taught her to do was to push the ball away with her nose to give it to us. So we made it more of a game of giving things away is a game and we'll give it right back to you. So by giving the value right back to the animal, it reduces their stress and anxiety and you make the game fun of, oh, okay, I'm gonna give you my thing and you're gonna give it right back. And by adding other people into it, it puts the value on the game and not the value on the person the or the item. Because yeah. the activity becomes a fun thing. It's like, oh, this is yours. You can have it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of like Micaiah cleaning his cage for me. Yes. That's awesome. Um, somebody asked a question. Um, Julianne. She says, is resource guarding of a person or an animal linked to jealousy? The fear of losing their companion to someone or something else. So jealousy is kind of controversial. Uh, people are still debating if animals can be jealous or not. What are we seeing? Uh, I think animals can be jealous. Uh, so it has to do again with the resource or it's insecurity, it's based in anxiety. So again, we have to raise their confidence a little bit uh, and you have to be creative of what kind of games can you teach that animal and just teach them that, that again, if you see the behavior express, it's just information for you of, oh, I got work to do. What would I rather them do instead and start training and teaching that? Can, with that being said, can I say something real quick? Um, because I know a lot of people in, in, in I've, this is where it comes into practice or play or concern. If you're working with a trainer, a behavior consultant that says they only use positive reinforcement training, a red flag should go up that says this person may not understand behavior and learning theory because it is impossible to use just positive reinforcement. This is where applied behavior analysis comes into play because I will see people put themselves in a position where they get hurt because they're trying to use positive reinforcement so they let the animal keep attacking or biting them because they don't want to use anything else other than positive reinforcement. Right. If I find my, what's that? I was going to say, they should watch how nature truly operates. Oh, I know. Watch a, watch a, watch a wildlife documentary. Yeah. <laughs> but if I find myself in that situation, um, this is what I do. I do whatever I have to do to keep myself safe, keep the animal safe, get that animal off of me immediately, and I'm not using positive reinforcement to do it. <laughs> <clears throat> if I can, I will throw something away to redirect attention. If that does not work, um, usually I'm not taking that much time to figure out what I need to be doing. I do whatever I have to do to get that animal off of me, force, push, whatever. And that is using aversives. That is a positive punisher. But the thing is, note to self, this is an issue. This needs training. Don't let that force or that situation happen again. Because if you do, now the undesired behavior is being reinforced. Correct. It's being rehearsed and reinforced. So people ask, so if, if you have an event or a situation, managing it and putting that particular individual in like a timeout, that's just a way to diffuse and calm things down. True training is like, okay, so now they have a sensitivity to certain items or certain events. I need to work on that. So typical protocol is, okay, let's look at each individual event. So the item itself, the environment, your approach, another animal present. And then a protocol would be, okay, let's 
introduce those things at such a low intensity with a very low item or value that the animal could care less. But you're trying to teach the game of, okay, this is the situation, but it's non-threatening. You don't have to worry and all good things happen. If I'm here or if another animal's here, you get the bomb, you get some really good stuff. Um, and once they understand that game, what I usually do is a cold trial on my next session just to test my previous session to see where I'm at. Before I say, should I stay at the same place with my protocol? Should I dial it back a bit? Or can I push it to the next level and intensify uh, the challenge a little bit? So, and then my next session, again, I'll do a cold trial again, just to see where I'm at and how the animal's doing. But you always start with a very low intense presentation of, okay, here I am, I'm approaching, or here's the other animal in the same room, everything's chill and calm, everything's pleasant, all is good, and you might get a, a little treat, something short and sweet. Um, and then the next time, as the experience goes on, you start challenging the intensity to the point where you eventually get to uh, a real life mock-up of, okay, I'm gonna give you a rawhide now, I expect you to go up into your crate, yay, okay, everything's working. So now my training plan has worked. So we always start on a low intensity presentation, do a bunch of repetitions and trials, test the value of your training. And if things are going well, then you bump it up a little bit. If things aren't going well, you might have to dial it back. So yeah. these are the things you need to do. Yeah, something else we practice here um, <clears throat> is a drop on cue. Um, which will come in very handy, comes in very handy. If you're working with a resource carter, I highly suggest you te teach a drop on cue. And what made me think of that was you saying you start with an item of no value or little value. Um, we teach this to the parrots. We teach this to our deaf dog drop on cue means that means drop it. Um, we are going to reinforce this 100% of the time. Yeah. So make the incompatible behavior really strong. So doing the it's yours game or drop, make those super valuable games. Yeah. Yep. Super valuable. Um, the, the, the animal I was talking about before that um, takes things really fast. It happens to be Coco, the 30 year old umbrella cockatiel. Um, so I was just like this and he can move so fast. He's in your face before you even realize it. So that's what we did was we taught him a drop on cue. And you know what I started with was a tissue. I gave him a tissue as soon as he dropped, bridge, reinforce. And yeah. then take it from there. So um, I just introduced those two, maybe three books where people can have oh, yeah. a great book. Um, yep. And it's going to be backwards. Mine. So it's a small little book by Jean Donaldson. Mine, A Practical Guide to Resource Guarding and Dogs. Uh, a little technical, but at least you'll get a general understanding of what a protocol is, where you start with low intensity and you build it up. Uh, again, a little technical, not for everybody, but there's some good tidbits in there. The okay. other one is by Patricia McConnell, and the name of the book is Feeling Outnumbered, Living in a Multiple Dog Household. So that's another good one. And then I started, the, I actually wrote an article in the Chronicle of the Dog years and years ago on sibling rivalry. And sibling rivalry has to do, again, living with a group of dogs that either their relationships aren't going well or you have a resource guard in the house and just the environment is flaring up uh, the tension. Uh, so there is a sibling, the evolution of sibling rivalry if you want to geek out on different species. Yeah, I want, I want to geek out on that one. What is it called? Evolution? Of the sibling. Evolution of Sibling Rivalry by Douglas Mock and Jeffrey Parker. That and it be. is Oxford, Oxford Series in Ecology and Evolution. I know it's backwards. But you learn some really interesting things about Yes. So this has been um, a fabulous live stream, Daphne. I mean, this has been in the works for quite a while to bring you on here. Um, we are on the hour. Um, thanks for coming on. I do want to let people know how to contact you. Um, and also there were several questions asked throughout here. 
Um, once my day is done, I'll go back and look at them. Um, but Daphne and I will come back in and look at your questions and answer things we couldn't address during the live stream. Unfortunately, yep. an hour is very short. And um, an hour doesn't usually give a lot of time to resolve a behavior issue. Um, so anyways, I'm going to pull up how you can get a hold of Daphne. I know some people were asking. Daphne is out of the state of Washington, um, but you can, sh her services are online as well. You can reach Daphne at on her website at caninepartnership.com. You can also um, email her, Daphne at caninepartnership.com. And you can also follow her Facebook page, which is K9 Partnership. Yep. Yeah. So I've been following you for quite a while, Daphne. Um, and I want to thank you for coming on here. Yeah, um, thank you. I'd love to invite you back on. That would be great. Okay. Maybe we pick another topic or maybe we go a little deeper into resource guarding. Mm. I'm sure we could go a lot of different places with different yep. topics. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to go ahead and end this. Join us every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Pay attention to our Facebook page. I would highly suggest you turn on your notifications for the Animal Behavior Center and for Daphne at K9 Partnership so you don't miss a post or a live stream or whatever else we do. If you like um, Coffee with the Critters gives you a sample of what we do in our memberships and projects. And you can find out more about our memberships and projects at the animal behavior center.com. And with saying that Daphne, maybe I would love to have you in our level two membership um, for a group discussion. I'd be honored. That'd be awesome. Okay. Um, you can find out more about our memberships and our projects, our online learning services at the animal behavior center.com. And you can always reach me uh, my email address, Laura at the animal behavior center.com. And uh, with that being said, I got to run because we got an open house getting ready to start. So if you are within the area, we have people driving in two and a half hours to get here for this today. Um, sign up for our email newsletter. You can do that right here on our Facebook page. Um, my next event is not this. It's Rocky going on a commercial shoot. <laughs> <laughs> in less than two weeks. Then after that, I will be in Montreal for a two-day seminar on working with animal, animals and with abnormal repetitive behaviors. There we go. All right, 10.03. <laughs> um, so Daphne and I will be on to answer any questions that we missed during the live stream. All right, so happy holidays, everybody. Happy New Year. Thanks, Daphne.